To hear the voices in my own blood, feeling its weight, hesitate, shudder, and then drop away like a dream, glittering coldly with shadows precise and long in the leveling. Light, I see the ruin, gaunt, classic clay hills striking south, straight as a knife, edged through the sand and baleful beauty in the infinite. Cotton quickly extinguished, black faces and the staring eyes, the figure sudden in our headlight, dark and shapeless against the soaked blackness of the cotton land, mud lifting, stride and darkness behind us. In the darkness, yes, they are still here. Young men with the other men in gray stepping toward the lethal spring, thickets of dogwood and red bud to the sound of bird song. It's that cannibal blood you can't get rid of. The folks down here just in trouble and can't claw out. Got good hearts, but can't claw out. The trouble it is hard to claw out from under the past, the past wave, yeah. Live and lean hit men, narrow ass did like the men who rode with forests, shuddering with automatic violence. The cliche of hate. There's a stiffening and a flicker of suspicion. Suspicion of the outlander or the corrupted native. I just want to ask one question. I just want to ask where you're from. An evasion or refusal of the subject. Something about cotton over at Oxford that fellow Faulkner. He's lost a lot of friends in Mississippi looking at the seedy side. Does he criticize? A hill man set deep in the flesh, hard and sly by turns out to preserve what you might name the old southern way. What he was raised up to among his kind. The angry and the ambitious and disoriented and disposed in the deep shadow. He is a force. There's another suspicion, the instinctive fear that the massiveness of the concreteness of life will be violated. The fear of abstraction. There's something you can't explain what being a southerner is. The old, unappeased hungers. The old drives of nameless ambition don't take too much stock in Darwin. They don't think enough about blood. The little Negro blood, they don't take much to do the damage. He was for Wilkie, then for Dewey, then Dixie Cry, then Eisenhower. But Eisenhower doesn't satisfy. My friend, now there are handbills showing Harlem Negro and white wife lying in bed, Negro and white children, the new look in education. Segregation is the law of God, not man. These people will overwhelm. If there's trouble, it will begin with the redneck. He is the one on the underside with nothing. Between him and the bare black ground, the ground so poor you couldn't grow peas. He's got to be better. There's something, been on a high lonesome all by himself. But of course, we've got to keep the white race intact and power. A change is disoriented, especially if you're disoriented already. They have entered into the anonymity of the new world under pressure. Uncle Tom is doing a disappearing act. Old Black Joe is evaporating. This white man is of the Deep South. He's not interested in abstractions. People are emotional about their tradition. It's how your feelings get tore up all the time. It's getting damn hard to get white. You can't depend on law anymore. I don't believe in violence, but there's always going to be incidents. The word progress damns what he does not like. Sure and slow, a creeping process. Sure they aim for violence coming in here. The Negro facing the shotgun blast of a white man with a nice built business, preserving the traditional American values of individualism against anonymity, against the philosophy of the ad man and the gospel of the bitch goddess to be southern again to envision some healed image of their own identity taking refuge in the vision of a South redeemed. An antique virtue, but we've got to purge certain elements and what part of yourself will purge another part? The South is still a land of faith. There's only one question. What would Christ do? I don't care if Jesus Christ let you in. No black son of a bitch is coming in my front door. It's born and trapped accidentally into action. I'm Southern through and through. And what nobody understands is how a man can get cut up inside, all mixed up, getting all split up. Things just go round and round in your head. It's the hate hung on us by the old folks. Goddamn hate stuck in a crawl, but we can't pick it up.
Ready? Ready. Hold up, here we go. Don't blow with cage, don't blow with cage. Just play the best shit you ever fucking played. Don't blow with cage, don't blow with cage. Just play the best shit you ever fucking played. Alright. Jack White invited us to party. He wanted us to kick out the jams. Red light, it's time for us to party. I'm hoping we can kick out the jams. Don't blow it, Cage. Don't blow it, Cage. Just play the best shit you ever fucking played. Don't blow it, Cage. Don't blow it, Cage. Just play the best shit you ever fucking played. So low. You did not fucking kick out the jams You blew a cage, you blew a cage You played the worst shit you've ever fucking played You blew a cage, you blew a cage You played the worst shit you've ever fucking played Come on! Cage, Cage Yes, Jack White? That was the best guitar solo I've ever heard in my life oh, thank you! Do you want to start a band with me right now? <sighs> Yes. Now, don't leave me cage. Don't leave me cage. You played the best shit you ever fucking played. Don't leave me cage. Don't leave me cage. You played the best shit you ever fucking played. You played the best shit you ever fucking played. You played the best shit you ever fucking played. You played the best shit you ever fucking played.
What's up guys, it's Brendan Benson here. I'm third man, public access. I'm uh, I'm doing a drive-by, a little drive-by here uh, in East Nashville, cruising over to my friend Robin Hitchcock's house to see if he might do a little song with me. I brought my guitar. Brendan and I are seven or eight feet apart and several years in distance. We're gonna play this for you live in four seconds. Bump, dad, what a little bump that.
Where you picking me up? Get me somewhere to stay. When I had no one, you gave me somewhere to play. Yeah. But you better watch out for me. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was tired, you gave me somewhere to sleep. Frozen Raven. Oh yeah, there's your cock fit. Good. <laughs> fuck, man. That's how fucked up I was. You gotta get the fuck out of here. To the fucking fruit district. Spooky prostitutes. Too. No, I don't give a fuck about them. I want a fuck good show. Fuck drums. Ziploc bag of fucking beef. <laughs> I wanna be a, I wanna be a fuck this shit.
To Rimele Thomas, reading from Nine Bar Blues from Third Man Books. Ancestors. In the beginning were the ancestors, gods of earth who breathe the air and walk in flesh. Their backs were straight and their temples tall. We carved the ancestors from the scented wood before the fire and the poison water took them too. We rubbed ebony stained oil on their braided hair and placed them on the altars with the first harvest, the nuts and the fresh fruit. None would eat before the ancestors were fed, for it was through their blood and toil we emerged from the dark sea. But that was then, and this is now, and we, we are another tale. It begins as all stories must, with an ending. My story begins when my world ended, the day my sister shoved me into the ancestors' altar. That morning, one sun before Omar Day, my bare heels slipped in bright gold and orange paste. Circadia blossoms lay flattened, their juicy red centers already drying on the ground. The air in my lungs disappeared. Struggling to breathe, I pressed my palm over the spoiled flowers, as if I could hide the damage. Before Yura could cover her smile, the younger children came. Fela, Fela, they cried and backed away. The ancient ones gonna claim you. Their voices were filled with derision, but their eyes held something else, something close to fear. Claim her? Yira threw her head back, the fishtail braid snaking down the hollow of her back, a dark, slick ill. She is not worthy, she said to the children, and turned her eyes on them. They scattered like chickens. Shrill laughter made the circadian plants dance. A dark witness, the fat purple vines and shoots twisted and undulated above me. I bowed my head. Even the plants took part in my shame. And I don't need you, Shadow, Yira said, turning to me her face a brighter, crooked reflection of my own. You are just a spare, a spare. Only a few breaths older than me, Yira, my twin, has hated me since before birth. Our Oma says, even in the womb, my sister fought me, that our mother's labors were so long because Yira held me fast, her tiny fingers clasped around my throat as if to stop the breath I had yet to take. The origin of her disdain is a mystery, a blessing unrevealed. All I know is that when I was born, Yura gave me a kick before she was pushed out of our mother's womb. A kick so strong, it left an impression. A mark like a bright shining star in the middle of my chest. This star, the symbol of my mother's love and my sister's hate, is another way my story ended. 
I am told that I refuse to follow, that I lay inside my mother after her water spill, after my sister abandoned me, gasping like a small fish, gasping for breath. But in her delirium, her mother sang to me, calling, begging me to take the journey on, but she made promises to the old gods, to the ancestors who once walked our land, to those of the deep, promises that a mother should never make. You wore the beady one, head so shiny, slick like a ripe green seed, our Oma would say. I hear an echo, a voice sweet for Oma, sweet as a circadia tree's fruit, but her mouth was crooked, slanting at me. Yura had as many faces as the ancestors that once walked her land, but none she hated more than mine. While I slept, Yura took the spines our Oma collected from the fish and sharpened them, pushed the spines deep into the star in my chest. I waked to scream, but the paralysis would take hold and I would lie in my pallet, seeing, knowing, feeling, but unable to fight or defend. When we were Lada, and I had done something to displease her, rise awake, breathe, talk, Stand. Yura would dig her nails into my right shoulder and hiss in my ear. Shadow, spare, thief of life. You are the reason we have no mother. It was my sister's favorite way to steal my joy. And then, when she saw my face cloud as the sky before rain, she would take me into her arms and stroke me. There, there, my sister, my second, my broken own, she would call. When I descend, you can have mother's comb and put it in your own hair. Remember me, she would whisper in my ear, her blood soft and warm as any lover. Remember. And then she would stick her tongue inside my ear and pinch me until I screamed. Our Oma tried to protect me, but her loyalty was like the Suwa then, inconstant, mercurial. Oma only saw what she wanted. Older age and even older love made her forget the rest. Come. I could hear the drumbeat echo of her clapping hands. Yera, Thela, she sang, her tongue adding more syllables to our names. Yera, Thela, the words for one and two. The high pitch meant it was time to break Oma's hair. The multiversal loops meant she wanted the complex spiral pattern. Three hours of hard labor, and my hands did not clap first, maybe less if Yera was feeling industrious. So for Oma calling us back home, I wiped my palms on the inside of my thighs and ignored the stairs. My sister did not reach back to help me. A crowd had gathered, pointing but silent. No words were needed here. The lines in their faces said it all. I trudged behind you as Paul straight back, my eyes focused on the fishtail's tip. I should have buried you at the afterbirth. Thank you.
On July 9th, a 23-year-old woman named Ruth Christensen entered Schinders, the magazine shop on the corner of 8th Street and Hennepin Avenue in downtown Minneapolis, around the block from the Club First Avenue. Her backpack was filled with leaflets headlined, Stop Porn Now, a, ca a container of gasoline and a match. Beforehand, she had written a four-page suicide note, copies of which were delivered to the mayor's office and the Minneapolis City Council. Christensen, who had been abducted and raped several years prior, wrote, Sexism has shattered my life, psychologically, economically, spiritually. Because of this, I have chosen to take my life and to destroy the persons who have destroyed me. Schinders had two locations at the opposite ends of the same block. The one on 7th Street specialized in out-of-town and foreign newspapers. The one Christensen went into on 8th Street sold pornography, though not exclusively. Blocky, as the area ringed by the two shinders was called, was essentially downtown Minneapolis's small-scale version of Times Square. Its movie theater, video arcade, a large McDonald's, and the notorious dive bar Moby Dick's attracted a sometimes sketchy nightlife, a lot more than sometimes. By 1987, some 25% of all the city's reported crime was committed there, and the entire block would be razed a year later. Christensen had been deeply affected by Andrea Dworkin, the feminist lecturer who had taught at the University of Minnesota the previous fall and was an outspoken anti-porn activist. Christensen walked into the store, stood in the middle of the floor, and splashed gasoline on her head. A loud whoosh alerted the others in the store. 
I turned around and saw a girl, 25 to 30, with short curly blonde hair, on fire, and so were newspapers at the front of the store, an eyewitness said. It was really strange, no screaming or anything. It may have been a coincidence that this appeared less than two blocks from the place Purple Rain had been shot, but it didn't seem like it. The Twin Cities were headquarters for an anti-porn for the anti-porn debate of the mid-80s. At the end of 1983, the Minneapolis mayor, Don, Donald M. Fraser, had vetoed a city ordinance that, as the Washington Post's Jonathan Yardley wrote, would have made pornography a form of discrimination against women and thus a violation of their civil rights. End quote. The city council, by a vote of seven to six, had argued in the ordinance's favor. The Harvard professor, Dr. Alvin F. Poisson, who in 1984 became famous as a consultant for The Cosby Show, examined Prince's appeal for Ebony magazine rather dryly. Quote, Sex and rebellion sell particularly well to adolescents in search of an identity who wish to gain a quick-fix psychological independence by outlandish behavior, dress, and musical styles. The current TV-slash-high-tech generation is particularly prone to latch on in desperation to the latest glittering fads. Prince raises sex to the status of a deity and gives it a religious quality that provides support and appeal, I'm sorry, a support and approval to young people for acting out their sexual impulses. Right now, he, it, at best, he is a controversial role model for our youth. At worst, he steers them into a shallow, misguided, and potentially destructive direction. Responding to a different Prince feature, one irate Ebony reader sent a letter that went, You deify Prince who seems bent on shoveling spiritual confusion down the throats of youth of this nation. I mean, can you really expect your readership to believe that Prince, who deifies the sexual act, is successful partly because of his religious faith? What God? Prince's music contradicts the major religions of the world. What God? Not Allah, not Jehovah, certainly not Jesus Christ. His lyrics and onstage behavior seem more the reflection of some sort of a fertility cult replete with temple prostitutes. In the wake of Purple Rain, even a far less overt prince was too much for many. He was, quote, the filthiest rock and roller ever to prance across the stage, crusading anti-rock minister Dan Peters of St. Paul's Zion Church Christian Center fumed that fall. The fact that Side One of Purple Rain ended with a backward mask recording of Prince singing, I know the Lord is coming soon, coming soon, just made it worse. Kids come up to us and say, see, that shows he is a Christian, Peters said. And I say, as far as we can tell from listening to the lyrics, his Lord is a penis. Thank you. Got me. 